Hi everyone and welcome back to the Jack and Joe show in what has been a um, eventful afternoon for Fulham Football Club on a day that we're not playing. Uh, first and foremost, Jack, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. How are you, Joe? How was your run in Bournemouth as well? The run was a success. Um, went to Bournemouth for my granddad's birthday. My granddad's birthday was success. a success. The run was a success and Fulham was the only thing letting the weekend down. <laughs> so aside from that, it was great. Um and even got a, a donation or two based on last week's video. So thank you very much to those who did. Very kind of you. Um, but let's get into football matters. Um, and we're not going to go to the Bournemouth game first. We are first going to talk about the aftermath of that Man United game, um, which we didn't speak about last week for a reason. And the reason was that we didn't know what the bans were. We now know. So first and foremost, it goes without saying, Willian has served his ban. He's back. Mm-hmm. One match ban. Uh, if only it stopped there. Marco Silva has been banned for two games, and Mitrovic has been banned for eight games. One of which has already been served against Bournemouth, so he's out until that Southampton away match in the middle of uh, May, also known as Eurovision Day to those who celebrate, like me. Um, mm. Issue with this, Jack. First and foremost, is that it doesn't seem to be done there. Uh, this was sorted after a hearing through a uh, third party, which means the FA are apparently going to appeal these bans. And by appeal, we actually mean try and get them to be longer um, or perhaps the fines to be worse, potentially both, most likely both. Um, I think that we don't need to dwell on this too much, Jack, because like we just said off camera, we're all in the same boat here. I think we're all of the opinion that Mitrovic and Marco Silva deserved punishment. I think that that is true. I think the issue with everyone is the length of the ban, especially when you take into account other bans for similar offences or for completely different offences. For example, um, Luis Suarez's um, infamous um, racism charge, which got an eight-game ban. And, you know, that was a while ago. It wasn't last week. So I'm aware that it's not as cut and dry as oh he got this so he should get that mm. um but you have to question it and i wanted to get your immediate reaction we're about an hour and a half after the news broke at the time of filming um what are you thinking first of all we are lucky we're in a position where this won't affect our season it won't have a severe consequence on the outcome of Fulham season, that being obviously Mitrovic out for a, a number of games. I can completely understand that the FA have a duty to protect their referees by doing so, appealing this ban, appealing the decision, appealing the outcome. Yeah. However, it just wasn't as big of it as a thing as everyone's making out. Uh, and the problem I have with it is if this was a player who was English, let's say Mason Mount, Calvin Phillips, someone like that, it just would not have been as sensationalised by the media, um, by um, pundits, as it has been with Mitrovic. Um, it was a long time ago now. It was a crazy moment in a crazy game. Um and we deserve something from that. We deserve punishment from that because it was just a bit mad. And the things you mentioned earlier with um, Patrice Ever and Luis Suarez, John Terry and Antoine Ferdinand was in an era where things weren't cracked down on so much, albeit incredibly bad and should never happen in our game, but it was in a year of 2011 or 2012 where uh Things weren't in cancel culture. And I feel like Mitrovic has been cancelled because of this, Um, because he's an easy target, because of the reputation he had in that one game he had for Newcastle all those years ago. Frankly, it's disappointing because it gives the club a bad representation um, after a very, very positive season. It gives um, Marco Silva a bad representation where he could be nominated for manager of the year, um, based on what happened to us this season, people might think twice now about that because of what happened at Manchester United. And unfortunately, 
after so much praise was given to Mitrovic for a start of the season, now we're going to see more and more people talk negatively about him because of what happened at Manchester United. And one more point to make on this. Literally last night with Abdoulaye Ducore on Harry Kane, there's more contact there. I know it's player on player, not player on referee. There's more contact there. It's more aggressive, uh, but that will only be a three-game ban. Um, and I just think that the way it's all blown up from from because the red card was branched immediately, it was a push. It wasn't as bad as I don't as everyone's making it out. But this is football, and and you have to just comply with the rules these days. Otherwise, you're you're just going to get punished. It's so disappointing to see. However, it's not going to be detrimental to the end of the season for Fulham, which is which is great. Yeah, um, worth pointing out that it sounds like the three-game ban is the default charge for something like that. So you get the three-game ban. Then there's an additional three games on top of that for um, the fact that it was a shove on the referee. An additional two games on top of that were verbal. And I've got to say the verbal one confuses me because I don't like the way players speak to referees, you know, but the fact of the matter is that everyone does it. And if you're going to ban Mitrovic for two games for that, because you have to take them in isolation, mm. the charge is a two-game ban for verbal abuse to the referee, which is completely fair enough if everyone that does it gets the two-game ban, but they don't. I haven't seen no. anyone get a two-game ban for that, it, ever. Um I know that's not the way they're looking at it, but that's the way they should look at it. Um, never forget the way that this has happened. Never forget this because um, I'm sure similar incidents will happen. Um, and if similar charges aren't handed out, then I'm sure that Fulham could actually um, look back on this and maybe take it a bit further because there is only one positive that is coming out of this. And I don't see it as a great positive, but it's something to take at least. And that is the fact that Mitrovic is far less likely to leave in the summer. And that is the only saving grace in that his, re his re uh, reputation right now in terms of football is low. Not in terms of as a footballer, but in terms of as a person. And it shouldn't be, but it is. And that will play to our advantage. Um, I also hope he remembers the, su the support that he got from fans in the club. And to be honest, what was a stupid moment from him? Uh, in a massive game for our club and you know he he fucked up like he wasn't wrong to be sent off he fucked up um we've all forgiven him um and i hope that he remembers that because um i'm still we're still out here you know supporting him when he deserved to get banned we just disagree with the length of the ban i think that's what we're trying to make clear here and it's var checking club badge once again unfortunately yeah that's a huge issue isn't it yeah um no, no one tell me Big Six bias doesn't exist, by the way. I will argue with you until the end of time, even if it's not such a thing as the referee is thinking it consciously, subconsciously, yeah, subconsciously. it is a thing. Yeah. It is a yeah. thing. It is. Anyway. Uh, it's sad. I, 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 even, you know, the Bruno Fernandes thing against Liverpool, he does make contact with the linesman. Yeah. Nothing's made of it. Um in a game they were losing and, and losing their heads at. I just think the quote, throw the book at Mitrovic, yeah. is extremely infuriating. Yeah. Because all I have to ask is why? Yeah. Why why do that? Why is he such an easy target? Um, it's very unfair. I would love, I wouldn't like to see, because it's not nice in football, but I'd like to see if a similar situation that like happened if, again, like I said, like an English player or any player, I wonder what it would be like. Even the Wolves not in Forest game at the weekend. Who was that refereed with, by, Jack? With Chris Kavanagh. A lot of aggression towards the referee. And every single... We'll watch the game tonight. We'll watch Chelsea v Liverpool tonight. We're recording on Tuesday. And there will be a decision and there will be ref players surrounding referees because it happens every single game. And I don't know why Mitrovic has been completely made an example of. Uh, I well, think I do know uh, why. A, a key reason, actually, I think, Jack, as well, is you, you made the point earlier about, you know, would people have cared if it was a different club? I think that you're right. Would people have cared if it wasn't 
an FA Cup quarterfinal on terrestrial TV at prime mm. time on a Sunday or Mother's Day? No. Let's say this was in the Bournemouth game on Saturday, 3 p.m. kickoff in a sort of, you know, clash that not many people outside of Fulham and Bournemouth care about. Um, not on TV. You just see the highlights. This would not have been made into the media storm that it has. Because um, even Wolves versus Forest was exactly that. And that's exactly, exactly why nothing was made of it. Exactly. And <sighs> that is why it's infuriating. But Jack, let's move on. It's done. We knew he was going to be yeah. banned. We went to Bournemouth on Saturday. And this actually concerns me more than the Mitrovic news. Um, I've seen a lot of people going on about how this was the game of two halves. Um, I actually don't agree. I think that we were good for about 20 minutes on Saturday. Um, And I think that that ended when Robinson hit the bar with a wonderful strike that deserved a goal. Um, Wonderful move for Pereira's goal. Uh, Wonderful move setting up the cross that led to Robinson's shot. And after that, I thought we were um, hopeless to be honest with you. And I haven't said that many times this season. Um, I thought that we were really poor at the back, um, which is rare. Let's face it, it is rare. And I thought that we were dreadful going forward. And I've seen a lot of people point that at Vinicius, who I thought was, yes, very poor. But you have to also admit, he had absolutely nothing to work with on Mm. Saturday. He was very poor, very below par performance. But oh my goodness, the delivery was dreadful. And Dan Cook made this great point on the podcast. Why is it that when we go down a goal or we need a goal, like a winner or something like that, we only lump balls into the box? That's almost like it's that or nothing. Um, when we play through teams, we can be so good, like that Pereira goal. And it's frustrating. Um, I don't want this to make, a, make this a doom and gloom video, but I do think that is the season done in terms of anything mm. Uh, major happening in terms of Europe. I think that's fine. I, like, we're all hoping for a top half finish now. So at the time of filming, we've got Chelsea Liverpool tonight, as well as um, Leicester Aston Villa. Come on, you Foxes. Come on, you Scousers. Let's do it. Um, it's one of those <laughs> things where let's just try and finish as high up the table as we can yeah. and above Chelsea. But for me, Jack, that was the final nail in the coffin in terms of Europe. I know it's still feasible in terms of the points, but. Um, mm. I just think that we're not quite there in terms of squad depth. Um, And I think that was encapsulated by the fact that Bournemouth made game-changing subs that we basically weren't able to do um, on the weekend, which was a little bit humbling. Um, We must remember that we've all spoken, me included last week, about the easier fixture list on paper. We're playing teams that are absolutely fighting for their lives. And you could tell in that Mm. second half that Bournemouth needed it and wanted it a lot more. Um, which whilst being frustrating is understandable. Um, That doesn't make it any less frustrating as a fan when you're there and you're watching them waste time as we would do in their position at the end and the clock's running down and you're just getting frustrated. But, you know, fair play to them. I thought they were very, very impressive in the second half in terms of doing the basics right. Mm -hmm. I thought the second half in terms of a football game was dreadful in terms of both teams. I thought that neither Mm -hmm. of us could do much with it, you know, Wonder goal from Tavernier. Fantastic. I was right behind it, unfortunately. Great goal. Um, And then the uh, Dom Slanky goal, to be honest, was quite frustrating from Robinson's part. Just silly. Um, Just just clear it, mate, to be honest with you. Um, But it's a lapse in concentration. It happens. It's so frustrating. Um, Jack, have you got any additional thoughts on this? Because I don't want to dwell on it too much. I'd like to talk about West Ham. Yeah, West Ham United. Um, I, 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 I just... I don't know, you know, I, I I was working for context. So like when usually I'm working and I lo- and we lose a game, there's an element of frustration there, but there's an element of professionalism. You've got to, you know, finish a job and, 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 you know, do your work, whatever. But I literally, for I was went, I just went, oh, well, but it doesn't really make a, a whole lot of difference to anything really. It's annoying to lose a lead because we look so promising in the first 20. And you're right. We shouldn't be pumping balls long to Vinicius later on. We should try and play through teams. However, naturally, there's an element of panic that of comes course. into play yeah, when true. you're running out of time and you need a goal. Um, so naturally, you're just going to get the ball as far forward and pit, up the pitch as possible. Um, I have to be. I have to say, though, um, and I think it's due because last season we gave them a lot of stick because we were toe to toe with them in the championship. They had Parker for the first three, four games this season. Bournemouth were very, very, very good. 
And they showed characteristics of a team that can stay up and might stay up. And I'd be fascinated to see what they get on, how they get on tonight against the Brighton team, who are in a very similar position as we are. Um, yeah. And a player in Don Solanke, I thought was brilliant, like really good. Yeah. And if if Bournemouth were to go down, oh, as a 100%. as a plan 100%. B, he's really good. And that's so weird to say because I was like, every time he scored last season, I'd go off. Oh, say, <laughs> but I'd love him. I'd I'd like him to be at Fulham at some point. I think he'd be great. Um, when when they made the two changes in Tavernier and I think Christie who came on, I just thought. Well, that's not going to do much. I, they're not yep. very inspiring players, and I and I thought that when they signed them last season in the summer as well. Yeah. But here I am, wrong and and been proven wrong. And I thought that the spirit they showed, um, I thought was was impressive. Um, and look, Sasa Lukic came on and looked okay. I thought Harrison Reed was our best player. I was I was uh, actually going to say I was um, probably the most impressed with Lukic mm. that I've been because. Um, you know, I know there was nothing of note, but every touch he was looking forward and driving us forward and trying mm. to get that goal. And I, I, I liked that a lot. He seemed confident when he came on, which is a relief because previously I thought he didn't. And I agree with you. I thought Harrison Reid, in particular in the first half, um, and in particular defensively, I know he also assisted the goal. Um, his work rate was similar to the United game the last time we played. and But in both games, I thought he was fantastic. I... I just, I just don't really know how and to the extent of how annoyed I, I should be. We put in a hell of a load of effort in the first half of the season. We we beat some very good teams, even after the World Cup, going to Palace and going to Leicester and winning games like that. Um, I just, you're always going to fall off at some point. Um, and I, I don't, and obviously with no Mitrovic, that's a huge factor as well. I, it's so weird. It's so weird because every game you want to win and every game you want to compete. And we have done that on Saturday, competed. But we lost to a team who just have more to play than us. Yeah. And that's just that just cut, might be a factor in all these other games we've got to play. And I think that Marco Silva will identify that and say that we need to up our game for the whole 90 minutes because we can't be having trends in games where we're starting so well and then we just get worse and worse and worse and end up dropping points because going into next season that's just worrying yeah that is worrying and uh, my friend texted me on saturday night and he said i'm really worried about next season and i said well that's a that's a bit of an overreaction let's see what we do in the summer let's see how we react with the squad and who goes and who stays um but it, it's certainly at the back of my mind however I still think there's enough in this team to even finish top 10. And I think that's yeah. an incredible achievement. Yeah. Yeah. And why not? Because we've got an easier fixture list and paper for the rest of the season than Brentford do, than um, arguably than Chelsea do. I think it's fair to say, if you look mm. at theirs. Um, let's see what happens and try and finish as high up as we can, starting on Saturday uh, against West Ham on Easter weekend. Um, so, Jack, first off, I think it's fair to say that we owe them one good and proper, like, I hope we really do them. On oh, they owe us one. Uh, yeah, well, we just really need to get some sort of aven revenge. I was going to yeah. say vengeance, and I was going to say avenge, and I was going to say revenge. Some sort of venge, I don't know. Avengers um, assemble. After, yeah, the Avengers, fucking Captain America at the back. Let's go. Um, uh. First off, team. What has changed since Saturday? The only thing that's changed is that Willian is back. Mm -hmm. um, that's it or that we know of. I mean, I don't think Cabano's far enough along to be in contention yet. So what would you change from the Bournemouth game? And following on from that, what do you think the score will be? Because you've seen West Ham quite a lot this season. You're going to see yeah. them again beforehand. So tomorrow, you know, yeah. Fingers crossed for a Declan Rice suspension or something like that. That'd be great. <laughs> um, but yeah, anyway, sorry, go on. Uh, okay. Um, I don't think... Tosin warrants come back in for Diop and Ream. I think that's fine. Uh, bear in mind, Robinson made another mistake. I don't think that warrants him to be dropped and we recall Joe Bryan quickly and put him in the team. Like, that's just not going to happen. Um, Paulinha, I just want to see this kid, not kid, but I want to see this guy play more and more and more because who knows, we might lose him. I just want to see him in a Fulham shirt. 
Paulinia with Harrison Reed. Hopefully he's not injured from where he had why, why he had to get substituted. I don't think that's going to be an issue. And then Pereira again in the 10. Um, him and Ream have played every single game this season, yeah. um, which is incredible. Uh, I probably would bring William back in. And then I would probably start, you know, you know I'm not going to enjoy saying this, but I would start Bobby Deacon over Reed and then play Vinicius up top and have Solomon coming off the bench. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, I, I, I agree with your 11, by the way. That's what I'd really? play. And I think the only thing that you could argue about is the striker situation because of how poor uh, Vinicius was. But then you remember that Brighton game uh, when we didn't start Vinicius and how he struggled mm. to even retain the ball. Um, in the first half on Saturday, Vinicius did help us do that. In the second, he didn't. But in the first half, he did. Mm. Um, I think what makes it a bit different, though, this game is West Ham aren't going to batter us in terms of possession and high press like Brighton did. Brighton are one of the best in the league at it. So that in itself lends to potentially a false nine working better than it did in the away game against Brighton. Um, that being said, the way we play hinges on a target man and Bobby Reed is not a target man. So I can see both arguments. I think that, you know, we've got Vinicius now for the next seven games starting unless he gets injured or suspended himself. That's basically it. So I think it would be a confidence killer for him to drop you, him. Yeah. Um, it'd, be, it'd be such a middle finger to him. Such a middle finger. So I think you start him. I think you start Bobby on the right, as you said. We thought we had a quiet game. Solomon had a very quiet game other than the one move for the goal, which is very nice from him. So mm. I would keep have him coming off the bench. I'm delighted that Willian's back because I think he we miss him so much when he's not there. Um, and yeah, I think the rest of the team I'd keep the same. I don't see a reason to change the back four now. Um, the midfield, um, you know, I don't know if there's anyone ready to, to start ahead of these guys at the moment. So I think that it's sort of right to itself. You've got Kearney and Lukic off the bench, maybe Harris having some involvement as well. Um, but I do think we're going to win this one, Jack, and I actually am very confident. Um, oh. uh, I'm going 2-0 Fulham. Um, wow. And I'm going Vinicius to score. Like he did uh, in the friendly. Like he did in the friendly. Maybe even the same goal, you never know. And the reason I'm saying that is because I'm expecting a reaction um, we got a reaction after the United game for about 20 minutes and Silva was fuming in his post-match interview that that's all we got. Um, so I think we're going to get a reaction for the full 90. We're good at home. Let's not forget that. We're good at home. I know the last time against Arsenal was rough, um, but we're good at home overall this season and West Ham are poor. Um, I do think they're okay defensively. Yes. Uh, so I think it'll be very tough, but they're a bit lacklustre going forward. So I really hope we can just keep them quiet and eventually break through and then maybe get another on the break at the end. But I'm going to go for 2-0 Fulham, Vinicius, and he will get the other one. Let's go, Willian. Willian. Right, there's a lot to say about West Ham. Um, first of all, they're playing tomorrow night against Newcastle, um, which was going to take a lot out of them anyway. Um, yeah. Bear in mind what they've got to play for. They have to back up that win on Sunday with, a, with another decent performance to try and get up the table against the Newcastle team, will be flying off that 2-0 win over Manchester United. The fans don't like Suchek. However, Suchek will probably play, uh, and barring yeah. injury. I don't see Flynn Downs starting ahead of Suchek. Um, that's something to revisit in the summer. Obviously, Declan Rice will leave. They basically have to buy two central defensive midfielders. Yeah. Whatever division they'll be in, that's going to be a task in itself. Danny Ings was really, really isolated on Sunday. He came off after literally not being involved whatsoever. It came on for Mikel Antonio. Um, so I do wonder, bear in mind who starts tomorrow night, who then starts on Saturday. The key player for West Ham is Jared Bowen. Proper, proper player. Uh, yeah. Really dangerous, really quick, good feet. We saw it at Hull. We're seeing it now. And he has a goal in him as well. He's very, very good. Hit the bar on Sunday. The other player to look out for and his midfield work is Lucas Paqueta. Obviously, Declan Rice is, is fantastic. We know that. But Lucas Paqueta off the ball made like, I think it was like nine tackles or 10 tackles on against Southampton. He was brilliant. Like Polinia so good. Numbers. I know, yeah. I, I tell you what, like that would be a great midfield battle to see. Um, and Paqueta's also got a bit of flair in him. He's got a shot on him. Said Ben Rama's also a really, really decent threat as well down the left. 
West Ham shouldn't be where they are with the squad they've got. They just haven't. They've had a lot of Conference League factors take a lot out of their team. Playing Thursday, Sunday is never easy. Although last season they made they they made it look okay. They they were fine in the Premier League. Um, I don't think we're going to win. I don't okay. think we're going to win. Um, based oh, just I don't, I don't, I'm not feeling much confidence in this Fulham team right now. Um, I don't see where that moment of magic is going to come from. If Vinicius is not on his best, best uh, if he's not on his best form, I don't see how he creates much up front. I feel like the creativity is going to have to come from the likes of Willian and Pereira. And if Solomon doesn't start, then Bobby Deagle would overread. Um, I think it's going to be 1-1 one, one, where we have to well, come from behind. Here's a positive from that, Jack, which I think we'll leave it with today. Yeah. That would be 40 points. Finally. Finally. 39 goals scored, 39 goals conceded, 39 points. We're just never going to make it to 40. <laughs> so we're going to make it to 40 and it's going to be 1-1. One, one. So it'll be 40 goals scored, 40, 40 goals against. <laughs> Sensational. In the 40th minute, even. It's uh, it's quite a weird time to support Fulham because with obviously everything that happened today, um, the accounts, of course, came out today as well. And yes. Fulham, that was actually what we were going to, I was going to open with, with this video. Yeah. But of course, the other stuff, um, we can maybe get into that on the Thursday club. I reckon they'll probably cover that in more detail. Um, but basically, we have had losses again. But that yeah. was understandable because it's a championship season. Yeah. Um, next season could look a lot more rosy if we stay up because of the television money that comes into the club. Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much in terms of FFP going for next season. It is a bit touch and go, though. Yeah. That's what I understand. Uh, we'll have to see what happens in the summer. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a blessing and a curse that we have. I don't I hate the word assets when it's talking about humans but you so know what degrading. I mean, like, assets yeah like yeah i mean they, they don't know what exists so i guess it doesn't matter but um <laughs> you know like if, if we made a big sale you have a lot more breathing room and i think we're bound but to lose someone you don't want to be uh, forced into making those you sales, don't want to be you know forced mean? into making the sale yeah uh you want to make the sale if you think it's an acceptable price and you have a replacement that you can sign for cheaper in my opinion um like mm. the brighton way so let's see what happens that could you know what, like, I don't want to lose Palini, I don't want to lose Mitrovic, but like I said last week, if a bid came in for 35 million for Andres Pereira, unfortunately, I'd have to snap your hand off for it. And yeah. I really like Pereira. Really yeah, like me him. too. I, there was a few comments disagreeing last week and completely open to debate and also don't necessarily disagree, but I just feel like that sort of money, you can replace him. You can. Mm. I wonder whether Fabio Carvalho will be involved tonight for Liverpool. I'm, I, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have any bearing on us. But the way in which his season has gone is a disaster, an absolute disaster. And even the way in which I thought that it would go because of how Liverpool's midfield is basically transitioning. It hasn't transitioned as much as I thought. Elliot's getting a lot of games. Bashevich is getting a lot of games. Um, and Carvalho just hasn't fit in. Yeah. It's remarkable. Uh, what what a shame. And, and a and a huge, huge, huge example of how the grass is not greener on the other side in football. So, um, Paulinia, <laughs> don't, <Yeah>. don't leave. <laughs> don't leave, please. We've got nothing left. <laughs> um, Joe, I think we'll leave it there. Um, it's, yeah. been a, it's been an interesting one and, and one that uh, hopefully next week we can have a few more smiles on the faces. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Jack. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Uh, enjoy the game against West Ham. Enjoy your Easter break, regardless of if you celebrate or not. Just enjoy the long weekend and a football-filled one. So have a good time. Yeah, for Lent, I hope Fulham are giving up losing games of football. So hopefully <laughs> we can uh, we can win one. And uh, I have a very, very good friend who's also named Joe, who's a West Ham fan. And uh, I would like to, uh, to get one over him uh, on Saturday afternoon. But hey... This is football. If we lose again, it makes it five in all comps and in a, in a row. I, I don't think that's panic button, you know, territory. However, it's it's just not very nice for morale inside the fan base. Joe, thanks so much for being here. Thanks a lot, Jack. Thanks, everyone. All right, guys. We'll see you next week for another one. Oh, come on, Fulham. Do us a, do us a favour and, and beat West Ham. Mm -hmm.